Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name is John Brown. I'm the chairman of the Queen Elizabeth Prize Foundation, and it's my very great pleasure to uh, welcome you all here tonight uh, uh, on the day of the award of the Nobel Prize for Medicine. Uh, I believe we're now listening to the Nobel Prize equivalent award winner for engineering, and we'll do that later. Uh, tonight's discussion, Challenging Engineers, a call for tomorrow's problem solvers is what we're here to listen to. In 2012, we launched the Queen Elizabeth Prize with a couple of aims. The first, to celebrate and reward feats of engineering, which have been of global benefit to humanity. And second, and most importantly, to inspire the next generation of engineers to take up the challenges that humanity will face in the years to come. And this year, last time, the Queen Elizabeth Prize Foundation published a report on the views and expectations of the profession from over 10,000 people in 10 countries around the world. Respondents see engineering as essential for innovation and economic growth and expect that it will have to solve the world's problems over the next 20 years. This was the resounding view amongst those polled and there clearly are plenty of these problems. In helping me to research uh, a book I recently wrote, uh, the McKinsey Global Institute looked into the world's most costly social burdens. These range from climate change to obesity and cost the world trillions of dollars. What's striking from that work and the Queen Elizabeth Prize report is the correlation between the world's problems and the areas where engineering will provide the solutions. Tonight's discussion will focus on how we, as engineers, can meet these challenges. Our panelists tonight embody the goals of the prize. They've made a tremendous contribution to improving lives around the world, and we're immensely grateful that they've been able to join us tonight. I'm delighted that there are so many students and engineers who are early in their career with us tonight. It will be your efforts, which ultimately determine just how successful the engineering profession is at meeting the challenges it has been set. I hope that this event and future winners of the Queen Elizabeth Prize will continue to inspire you in your work. And I'm delighted, too, that representatives of our corporate sponsors and partners are here tonight. We continue to rely on private support for our work. Without them, events like this would be entirely impossible. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us uh, tonight, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. And let me now hand over to Alok Jha, moderator for this evening. Alok, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lord Brown. And uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to tonight's discussion. I'm Alok Jha. I'm a journalist. And my specialism in journalism is to make, is to write articles, make TV and radio programs about science and engineering, which for me is a dream job, always has been, because science and engineering are areas where you get the best stories. They're always new stories, they're always challenging stories, unlike secretly all other areas of journalism I've been told, where basically <laughs> you just tell the same story again and again and again until people get bored. Um, <laughs> this isn't being recorded, right? Uh, so it's a real pleasure for me to meet the panelists tonight and to meet all of you, people who are future storytellers to me. So make sure you tell me all your wonderful stories of things that you invent in future. But tonight we're here to talk to two very special people, two eminent engineers, two people at the very peak of their profession. Professor Robert Langer is the winner of the 2015 Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. Bob is a chemical engineer. He is a David H. Koch Institute professor at MIT in the States. He works in the areas of drug delivery, tissue engineering, and nanotechnology. And during his decades-long career, his inventions have improved the lives of billions of people around the world. How many of us can say that? <laughs> He's inspired hundreds of people to follow in his footsteps. Please welcome Professor Langer to the stage. You get the central seat, I believe. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, 
Do you take a seat? Okay. Now, joining Bob is an engineer who has just completed one of the largest and most complex construction jobs in recent years. Ilya Marotta is the Executive Vice President of Engineering for the Panama Canal Expansion Project. She's the only woman to have held this highest post in Panama Canal's 100-year history. In 2014, she was awarded Outstanding Woman of the Year Award by the Panamanian Association of Business Executives. She's also recognized by Forbes magazine as one of the 50 most powerful women in Central America. Please welcome Ilya Marotta. <laughs> okay, so the theme of this evening's discussion is Challenging engineers, a call to tomorrow's problem solvers. And I'm going to ask each of our panelists, first of all, how they see their areas of engineering helping identify problems and finding solutions. But before we get to that sort of nitty gritty, let me ask each of the panelists something which I'm sure all of us ask when thinking about how we're going to progress our careers and our lives. Bob, let me start with you. What made you choose engineering? Well, yeah, I, I'll probably do better on a lot of the other questions, <laughs> but, um, but, but I'll, and I'll just be honest, which is a little bit embarrassing, but I was in high school and I was good in math and science and I was not very good at anything else like, you know, English and French and history and things like that. And so my dad and my, the guidance counselor said, well, you should become an engineer because you're good in math and science. And, you know, I, I really, didn't understand that. I actually thought at that time engineers ran railroad cars. And I, I, but you know, everybody was telling me if you're good in math and science, you should become an engineer. So I applied to college in engineering and I ended up uh, going to Cornell and then later MIT. And I mean, I'm, I'm very, very glad I did. I mean, I think engineering is a fantastic profession and I, I learned a tremendous amount, but really my motivation for doing it, you know, like a lot of high school kids, I just didn't know that much. And, and a lot of it does depend on, I think, the image, you know, engineering gets, the image other things get, uh, but, and, and, and what people who I thought were a lot smarter than me told me. So, I, mean, I remember going to careers counselors at school as well, and to filling out forms and thinking, well, what should I do? They told me I should be a hotel manager. So, <laughs> clearly they saw something much, much greater in you. Is engineering something that you, when you started doing it, did you think, right, this is it, I've, I've arrived, this is a wonderful thing, or did it take some time? Yeah, well, a well, couple points. First, you know, actually, the place that I applied uh, to college and ended up going into was Cornell. And Cornell is supposed to have actually the best hotel management uh, <laughs> school, school in the world. I should have gone there. And, 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 uh, and, and so everybody. I knew we had a link. Yes. It's, and, and, and in fact, it's funny. Every time I go to Cornell, I'm on their board now. I stay in that place, and it's, it's fantastic. You of know, the, it would be. Uh, it would be embarrassing if it wasn't. Yes. Uh, but it's, 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 so, I, I, so I thought being at Cornell, actually, being in a hotel was really important. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, so for me, it took a long time. I mean, I, I felt like when I was a, an undergraduate and then later a graduate student, um, you know, I, I enjoyed what I was doing, but it wasn't until later on that I really got to see how engineering could change the world and make it so much better place. And I think that it, it, it you know, I could see certain things like computers, the area, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more that I work in, which is the interface of biology and medicine on the one hand and engineering on the other, you know, I mean, that really, when I started, was barely existing. But later on, I think it's, you know, made, made an enormous impact. And we certainly will come back to that. And Ilya, let me ask you then, engineering, where did it start for you? Well, actually, I did not want to study engineering. <laughs> I was, uh, I love marine biology. I love to scuba dive. Jack Gusto was my hero. So I got a Fulbright scholarship to go study marine biology in the United States. So I was there a year and a half, and then when I went back to Panama for summer vacation, I realized that I would have to work like way out in the country, shrimp farms. So I said, uh, I don't think I want to do that for life. Um, and Panama, way back then, we're talking 30 something years ago, there was not a lot of research or stuff like that. So I said, well, I'm not going to go study marine biology, so I got to switch careers. So I lost a scholarship because it was for a specific career in a specific university in the state. But I wanted to do something by the ocean. I said, well, I want to be by the water, so what do I do? I said, well, I was pretty good at uh, math and science also. So I said, well, oceanography. But that was still very in the beginning for my country, so I said, no, I can't do that. I did a semester on that. 
And then I started looking for marine engineering. Why not? Ships near the ocean. So my dad told me I will pay only for four years of college. So all the universities in the States that offer that career, you would have to ship out a summer. Uh, so Texas A&M had a program when you did not have to ship out. And you could be a marine engineer to work in a shipyard, a design office, so you didn't have to ship out. So that's what I did. Um, so I graduated. I went back home. I applied for the Panama Canal, and I got a job in the shipyard. I wasn't like crazy about engineering. My thing was marine biology. I said, well, that will have to be my hobby, scuba diving and so forth. Once I started designing in the office, walking out to the shops, seeing how they were building, and then see a, a vessel with a, a modification that I had designed, like transiting the canal, I was like, wow, this is so cool. So that's when I start really getting into engineering. Once I started working, and then I, I love it now. So the, the theme that, very clearly, just from two data points here, so it's maybe not a trend, but, but, but the, it's the, there's no direct path to this, right? There's not like you wake up one morning when you're 15 years old and think, right, I must become this or that. And you had certainly had a slightly indirect path, but would you say that you learned something at each stage to move you into the next one? Oh, of course. I mean, I, I don't regret what I did at all. Um, and then actually, once I went into engineering, uh, every time there was an opportunity of a different job within engineering, I moved around. I, I moved around everywhere in the canal, and now I'm in program management. Not even, I'm not designing anymore or dual calculations, but I did cost estimating for a long time. I did, I wrote, uh, contracts for specifications for contract. So it's not only about design, it's engineering is a world. So, and now I'm in program management. And engineering certainly is a world. It's, it touches on almost every part of life <laughs> that, that you wish. And, and Bob, you're, you're an, a great example of someone who's managed to keep your fingers as, in as many pies as possible. Now, in modern scientific and engineering careers, you have to specialize always. You have to specialize. You have to do one thing. You don't get grants for lots of things. How have you managed to do essentially seven careers at once? <laughs> well, having wonderful students and postdocs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think if you're a professor, uh, you know, which, which I am, you know, so one of the things that's been wonderful for me is just having so many uh, energetic, smart, and industrious and entrepreneurial graduate students and, and postdocs. And, and I think what happens is, you know, they have their projects and they, you know, some of them want to become professors, some of them want to start companies, some of them want to do both. You know, to me, having a graduate students and postdocs, it's, it's not quite your children, but, but it's not that far away either. I mean, I still to this day, I get enormous satisfaction when they do well, and I get sad when bad things happen to them, and it just uh, it almost is like an extended family. And I think it's really working with them and through them that I feel like I can end up doing, you know, more than one thing. And, and do you think that um, do you think that the, 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 with academic careers the way they are and everything that there, it's a good idea to train lots of these people to then go out into lots of other fields? Or you know, some people would say perhaps we need more scientists, more engineers, the people should all go into those sorts of subjects. Yeah, I think it's good if lots of people go into engineering, but, uh, but no, but I, I, I um, you know, I, to me, really, you just want, I mean, what I want is people to be happy and to do things that are fulfilling to them. And so I think that whatever it is that is, makes them happy and is fulfilling to them, that's what you want to do. And everybody's different, you know, so I think what you want to do is create an environment you know, be an advisor, be an educator that allows people to grow and find the things that they really enjoy doing that they feel will really make a difference in the world. Now, the theme of tonight's discussion is about global challenges and how engineering is going to interface with those things. So the world may not look to engineers just to build bridges and buildings now. I say just to build buildings. I mean, these aren't simple things either. But to improve things like energy production or food security, solutions to global problems like healthcare, climate change, etc. Um, and engineers are expected to come up with solutions to all sorts of things like this, which is exciting, but also slightly, a, sli a slightly huge responsibility. Ilya, should engineers take responsibility for all of these things? Well, I think engineers have to provide the solutions, definitely. The responsibility of implementing those solutions depends on governments, on private companies, um, but definitely engineering, because the, the engineers become the brains that can make those changes. So with 
the innovation and the creativity of the engineers, then you can make a better world, of course. Then who's gonna implement all those wonderful ideas? Then, then you need companies and governments to actually put them into place. And, so, and Bob, I mean, do, do you think that engineering as a profession is taking responsibility for these things to think, well, we are the ones who have to come up with the initial ideas. And yes, there is a lot of, there are many steps before they become real world solutions, but you're the ones who have to come up with things. It's quite a monumental task, isn't it? It is, but I, I feel engineers do do that. I think there are a lot of great challenges. You mentioned some, and, and, and I think, and, and they're across the board, depending on what kind of engineering you do. But I think that, uh, I, I think engineers are very excited by those challenges because I think what they can see is that by trying to come up with some solutions to those challenges, they can literally change the world. They can change people's lives and, and solve some of the most daunting problems that, that we as a society face. So I, I, I don't think there's much that can be more satisfying than being able to contribute to something like that. And, and so it, it, the Queen Elizabeth Prize um, uh, produced a report, the Create the Future report, which identified many, many areas where, where engineering has a key role. And I mentioned some of them before, healthcare, climate change, food and energy security. Would you agree that though those are the sort of priorities, or, or would, is, is there a bigger list than that? You think, you know, this is where engineering can really start to solve global level problems. Energy is, is huge. I mean, the world is getting bigger and bigger, more people, more needs. So I think renewable energy is, is key for the world. I think water, uh, water conservation, it's, it's definitely very important, it's becoming. There's global warming. Uh, the raising of the oceans also. Uh, there's a lot of cities that are vulnerable. So I think there's a lot of challenges for us engineers to come up with solutions. And, and it's not only a solution, it's a practical solution that can be implemented. Because you can do something that is so expensive, it's not affordable, so you cannot implement. So it's, it's improving, so things become easier for, for the world, more accessible. So I think definitely electricity, food, you had mentioned food also. Uh, population is growing, there's a lot of hunger in the world, so if you become, you can create more affordable food for the people, and I think engineering can help in all of those things. In, in let's say, something like climate change, um, which is a multi, multivariate problem anyway, I mean, w w there are issues around emissions of carbon dioxide, but then also emissions around, as you say, sea level rise, food, all these things are uh, sort of linked together. As, a, as an engineer, as, as someone who's a problem solver, what are you, do you think the sort of the, the easy wins in terms of, say, let's say, for example, renewable energy? Where, where would you invest your time and effort if you were an engineer sort of starting out in your career? I think we've done a lot with solar and it's, it's improved. Before it was very unaffordable. Now you can see that solar energy, it's, it's not to the magnitude that it should be, but it's getting better. So engineers are developing newer technology that becomes more affordable. I think uh, water in the ocean, the waves, the tidal waves, I think there's a lot of potential there. And I think something that needs to be discovered. I see that we are doing a lot of space work and going out, and I don't think we're doing a lot with our oceans, which is two thirds of the planet, you know? So I think there's uh, a challenge in there and, and something that needs to be looked at, especially if, if, if the, lake, the, you know, the oceans are rising. I mean, let, let's look into that. But for example, the, I mean, shipping vessels, Technology has improved significantly, so we have less CO2 emissions, so bigger vessels, but with much more powerful systems that contribute. But it's not only that, so it's the whole package of the world on the different technologies that need to improve to diminish CO2 emissions. So it's not just about making a regulation or signing a treaty between countries, it's about what can the engineers can come up and create to help that really happen. What about technology that reduces carbon emissions somehow, sucks out carbon dioxide? People talk about these things. Are they just a blind alley, or do we need to sort of think about our emissions in the first place rather than sucking things out of the air? Uh, we need to think about emissions, definitely. I mean, that contributes not to make it worse. Of course, you also need to think, well, how do we reduce? But I think it's easier to plan how do we don't pollute anymore. So I think renewable, I think we need to be concentrating a lot more about the environment. How do we protect the environment in every sense? So that's also a challenge for engineers. Bob, you, you've worked for a long time on, in healthcare, mm -hmm. in, in health. Um, you've improved the lives of billions of people, as I said in the introduction. Um, we are all growing older. We are seeing all sorts of new diseases and problems. But there are also huge parts of the world with 
almost uh, no cures for the simple things that we, we wouldn't really bat an eye at. How do we, first of all, take challenge of the, the new conditions that many of us might face, but then also extend that out to the seven or so billion people in the rest of the world? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. You know, one of the biggest focuses of our lab today is actually taking some of the technologies that we've created in terms of drug delivery and better nutrition and things like that and working with the Gates Foundation to do just what you said, you know, to try to help people in sub-Saharan Africa and other places. And I, I think there's a, actually, to me, that's a, a, a terrific and very appropriate challenge for engineers. I think that examples, I mean, just simple, sometimes it's simple things. You know, one of the biggest problems in the third world, we don't do so well in our own world, is just even taking a medicine. You know, like what happens is that in the United States, and I imagine in Britain, you know, 50% of people that are supposed to take a drug to treat a disease don't do it. And it's actually less if you have a disease like Alzheimer's or mental health disease or things like that. In the third world, it's like less than 30%. And so we're now trying to use engineering to design pills that you could swallow that might last for a week, a month, a year. We're designing vaccines that, you know, most vaccines, if you ever take a vaccine, usually you get multiple injections. In our countries, people might take them, but in the third world, they don't. So we're designing vaccines that can um, sort of, in a single injection, give you the full dose. And a lot of this is actually material science and materials engineering, where we could make uh, little nanoparticles or microparticles that could pop at different times, say like a month, you know, six months, a year, two years. And similarly with nutrition, I think there's a lot that can be done. You know, we're working on new ways of designing um, ways of like giving iron and zinc and various vitamins and so that people can cook rice and, and, and have materials that you can withstand boiling for two hours, yet when you eat it, out comes the nutrients or vitamins right away. And, I, and again, a lot of this has to do with materials engineering, even though we're solving a very different problem. So I, I think there's an awful lot that engineering can do to help you know, most of the world and most of the poor world. And, and one of the great things about foundations like the Gates Foundation is they're very willing to give places like ours funding to try to invent those kinds of things. I mean, in, in, the, in the West and other places as well, as we grow older, I wonder if you can outline what kinds of challenges are we gonna face in terms of healthcare that you think, you know, we should really start getting on top of in terms of the basic engineering, the basic science to? Sure. Well, I mean, examples are, again, I'll just pick one example, which people may know. So let's say the, one of the biggest problems that we'll face and already facing our world is diseases of the brain, you know, like Alzheimer's, you know, that, that as people get older and older, uh, people, have Alzheimer's they, and, you know, and, and it's, a, you know, really like dead, I mean, it's an awful disease. People just, you know, their minds don't work. And people may or may not know this, but many billions of dollars have been spent on trying to design drugs to treat Alzheimer's disease. But, you know, people, but, but they really haven't used engineering, in my opinion, to address those problems. And so what's happened is pretty much every one of the clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease has failed in spite of many billions of dollars. And things like, can you even deliver the drug across the blood-brain barrier? I mean, that's an engineering challenge that really has not been solved at all. Um, you know, so I think engineering can do a lot to try to come up with ways to transport drugs, say, across the brain that might, if people are successful, come up with new treatments for a disease like that. And that, of course, could be helpful in other you know, neurological diseases, you know, even though Alzheimer's is probably the most prevalent, people die of Parkinson's, they die of all kinds of brain diseases. And so I think there's a tremendous amount that engineers can do to help, you know, diseases that are becoming increasingly prevalent in our world. To solve some of the problems you're talking about, let's say crossing the blood-brain barrier, making sure drugs can get from the body to the brain, which is a very difficult job. You say if engineers want to get involved with that, I mean, that's a that's a medical, very biomedical sort of subject, which requires almost a second degree to understand. I wonder how, how have you in your career and done it yourself, but also encouraged others to sort of talk between disciplines? Because that's where you identify problems, surely. Yeah, well, that's a great question. So what we do in our lab, so I, I was able to learn some things myself. The, what I did is I was, a, and I wasn't, I wish I could tell you, you know, it wasn't that different than high school. I kind of fell into some of these things. But what, for me, what made a difference personally 
was when I got done with my graduate degree in chemical engineering in the 1970s, I did something that was very unusual. All my friends went into the oil industry, they had tons of jobs, but I went and worked in a surgery department at Boston Children's Hospital. And I was the only engineer in the entire hospital. And it, but I learned a lot and I got a sense of, as a postdoc, I, I picked up some things. Today in our own lab, I have at any one time probably five to 10 medical doctors in the lab you know, gastroenterologists, ophthalmologists, neurosurgeons, dermatologists, they interact with the graduate students and postdocs and vice versa. And I think it's through that kind of interdisciplinary training that people pick up these things. Uh, and identify problems and also come up with maybe perhaps with slightly different ways of approaching a problem, solving them. Ilya, you must have the same thing in uh, huge projects that you run. Well, we have, um all the disciplines, we have the civil engineers, the electrical engineers, the electronics engineers. Um, and then of course, once you go into civil, you can have a structural, you can have a geotech, so it's, it's specialized also. Right. Do they all think they're the most important? Uh, no, <laughs> but I mean, you need, you, you need all of them. You cannot have one without the other. I mean, you might have a very nice lock chamber, but if you don't have the mechanical parts to move the ship and the electrical guys to move, you know, nothing's gonna happen. So you, they need to work together. Uh, in every sense, and, and see all the, the rela it's, it's really interesting that also, not, not only the engineers that design the system, but the people that are going to build the parts uh, ne need to be there at the beginning. Uh, during this project, we, we had these, the gates for the locks are uh, like a 10-story building, and we have 16 of them. So we had a designer in Netherlands doing the design of the gates. Um, and the guy that was gonna build them was in Italy. So once they got the blueprints to fabricate them, they said, this is ridiculous. You're making me like handmade parts. We, we, we need a, you know, again, cost. We need to have this as a process. I wanna be able to have standard parts to put them together. So the builders and the engineers need to work together uh, to make it, the process smoother, easier, faster. The same thing if we want the gates to be moved, we need the electronical and electrical engineers to, to be able to work together. How are we gonna operate this? How are you gonna synchronize this? So definitely, uh, it's a multidisciplinary life for the engineers. It's, you, you don't have one specialty on its own. We need to work together. And is the, is the mindset in the different engineers you're talking about, and in your case, Bob, the different people like the doctors and the material scientists and all these other people, are the mindsets very different or or can you sort of cross between different things just in the, in the service of one particular problem? Yeah, not, not in my case. I think for me, the electrical engineers are like geniuses. I, I, I just don't understand it. So I'm glad they're there to help me <laughs> in my parts. Um, I'm simple, mechanical engineering, a lot simpler. Electronical, electrical, for me, it's <laughs> crazy. So I'm glad there's people that have those abilities that can work with me together to come things together. But uh, yeah, everybody has their, their talent because it does require certain talent. And Bob, who are the geniuses in your groups? Well, I, I, I think all, probably all of them but me. You know, I, I feel like that, you know, we've had great people and, and I think that, you know, everybody I think brings their own special background and their own special, you know, energy to these projects. I mean, particularly the ones that have come and done, done very well. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I would feel like in our case, it's not any one discipline. I've been fortunate to have materials and superstars in chemical engineering, but also in, in medicine. And, you know, so I, th I think it, it, it really, you know, it's, it's the particular individuals, you know, that have been, been so key, almost irrespective of, of discipline. And when you sort of, when you s hire a new graduate student, is there something particularly you look for? Never mind what specifically their background is. Is there a particular mindset? Is there a an approach that you look for? Yeah, I do. I, do. I mean, I, I, I guess what I want is people who don't want to just do things for the sake of just understanding it. I want, I guess I feel like the people that are most successful that work with us, and doesn't mean that that's a rule by any means, but are people that not only want to do the basic research, but that want to see that translated into something that'll change mankind. So applications as well? Well, yes, that, that they want to make a difference in the world. You know, Ilya. I think their passion becomes that much higher for what we do. And Ilya, in your, in your line of work where you're 
building teams that do something so complex. Are there, again, are there, are there particular approaches you look for in, in, in the disciplines you, you employ? I definitely look at attitude of the person. Um, if you have this brain, this very brilliant person, but is not willing to communicate and be a team player, it, it's not go no good. You need to be able to share that. You need to be able to explain what you want to do. An attitude, I mean, somebody that's going to be a team player, that's going to be there, that's going to work hard, that's going to try new things, definitely that's, that's key. You, you need to have the right attitude. A, a team player, it's, it's very important for anything to succeed. I'm going to bring the conversation back to the global challenges, which is the theme of our evening. Um, and so, you know, every week, every month, there are um, enormous meetings and kind of discussions amongst politicians and policymakers uh, around some of the things we've talked about. So the UN Agriculture Committee on World Food Security is meeting uh, in a few weeks' time. There's the COP22 UN Climate Change Conference in Morocco um, next uh, in, in November, so the successor to Paris last year. These are places that are dealing with humongous problems. And you've both said that engineering has a role to play. Should engineers be going to those meetings? I mean, you're, you guys are doing very specific tasks in the real world. I mean, sh did you think that there's a role for engineers and engineering to be represented at places like those global high-level meetings, Julia? I think it would help, definitely it would help, because you're listening to firsthand the problems. So it can ignite, it can spark uh, to the engineer Hmm, I can solve this a certain way, or I can look at this a certain different way. So I think it would be more productive to have the engineers participate in some kind of a forum with the policymakers to see exactly what are the challenges you're facing so I can help you solve those challenges. So I, I think, yes, it would be a win-win, definitely. Well, I know you, you, you definitely do go to these sorts of things and sit on many panels ac across the world. What's the importance of having people like yourself, like Ilya, like uh, senior scientists involved in policy making like that or involved in f identifying big problems? Well, I think that I hope a couple of things. One is that we can hopefully educate politicians and others who don't necessarily understand science and engineering to the same extent that we might just because they're not necessarily scientists and engineers, but I also think it educates us. So I think it cuts both ways. And so you can find solutions, you can find the, what the problems actually are and how to then work out ways of implementing them. You were saying earlier before, of course, there's no point having an idea if you can't implement it. And unfortunately, the real world is implemented through politicians and pressure groups and those sorts of things. And is there much interaction, Bob, in, in the way that you work with, uh, do you work with politicians, do you work with policymakers to actually make these things get out there in the real world? Well, we work with policymakers and politicians in some ways. I mean, it really depends. Like I... For example, over the years, I've worked with like the FDA, which is, you know, has certain health policy things. I mean, you know, one of the things that we've done uh, in our lab is not only, like I say, as an academic group, we do, you know, basic engineering and science, but we also translate that and have created companies, which has the benefit of not only creating products, but also jobs. So. I've had, for example, both the governor of New York State and the governor of Virginia ask me to come and lecture to them about how to do the same thing in their states. And I've had presidents ask me, you know, again, about how do we, you know, do these kinds of things. So, so yeah, I, I would say that, that, that we do. And then sometimes there are places like World Economic Forum and others where you get various people with different disciplines together to try to, you know, figure out how to, how to you know, do different kinds of things. Over the course of your career, um, how have you seen the role of experts like yourself, uh, engineers, change in that sort of public policy world? I mean, th there must have been a time when the, 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 you weren't invited to those sorts of meetings if you were, weren't a, a politician or diplomat or something, but nowadays there's more of that. Have you seen that changing a lot? Well, I think one of the things that at least cha has changed a lot in the United States is this whole idea of uh, entrepreneurship, you know, especially in the biotech industry. I mean, when I was a graduate student, it really didn't exist. And today, like the area around MIT, you know, it's Kendall Square, you know, has the highest concentration of biotechnology companies in the world with market capitalizations probably net in the trillions. And I'd say Silicon Valley, the area around Stanford, I mean, that's, that's more in the IT area, but that's also done unbelievably well. And a lot of these things have, have 
grown out to an extent from people at MIT and Stanford. And I think that people realize that. So I think that, that it, it, and it's not just science, it's jobs, it's products, it's things that are fundamentally changing the pharmaceutical industry, the, you know, many of the challenges you said, you know, like you look at Google, they're trying to change the transportation industry and telecommunication. So all these things, I think so much has come out of discoveries and inventions and engineering in, at, at universities where, you know, university people have made huge contributions and then have worked to try to get those contributions to, you know, really make a difference in the world. So I think that there's a clear recognition that that happens. And, and let me ask both of you this question, maybe either first. That, that trajectory is to incorporate more uh, scientific and engineering expertise in the public sphere, in, in companies, et cetera, as Bob's suggesting. And that certainly happened in terms of how the way our economy goes. Um, do you think that's a trajectory that will carry on or do you see problems in that path? No, I, I think it will carry on. I think uh, past practice and experience, uh, at least in Panama, I'm seeing that um, the government is involved in the Panama Canal now after seeing this mega project being executed in a fairly good fashion, you know, within, I mean, we were a year and a half delay, but uh, within budget so far, it's, they're, they're realizing that there's something we can learn from, from the technical people, from the experts, in, in order to implement other projects. So I think they're banking on what we're doing, and they're asking for a lot of advice on the infrastructure projects that the government wants to put out. So, for example, uh, in some cases, they have sent us the terms of reference for the contract, so we review them, because they don't, they don't have a lot of a, a deep technical group within the government. They have mainly uh, officials. So they're, they're getting the feedback from us on how to go ahead about infrastructure in spec writing, in contracting types, in how to evaluate providers. So it's, I, I think, at least in my country, that I think it's going to, in, in the right trend. And Bob, I mean, as, as much as engineering and science and tech and expertise like this has been incorporated more and more, um, do you see any roadblocks ahead with this, this sort of more technocratic future? Well, I think there are roadblocks. I, I mean, first, I completely agree with what you said. I, I think it's here, it, this whole thing is it, it's here to stay, and I think it's only going to get stronger. But there are roadblocks. I mean, roadblocks can come in different forms, and they can come in different areas, you know, I mean, uh, I think health care costs and trying to control them, I mean, that's, that could be a roadblock for medicine. I mean, I think, um, you know, all kinds of things can create roadblocks. I mean, uh, it's, um, so I, I, I think you just don't know where they're necessarily going to be. I mean, you know, and, and there could be economic roadblocks. I mean, there could be, you know, new laws passed in different areas that could make things go either way. So I think there certainly will be roadblocks. The difficulty is, you know, necessarily figuring out where they're going to be. I guess things like climate change is always going to be slightly more political in terms of how people want to, whether they want to go forward with the, a technological solution to anything. Right. I mean, I think that that climate change, the question is, well, if something is in the future in people's mind, that's different than in the present. I mean, so something like healthcare costs, people can think that, well, they're spending a lot of money and that's bad. Climate, if, they're, if it's going to, if the real danger's further away, I mean, people may think about it differently, you know. So I, th I think it's, but it, it's, it's complicated. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to come through you for questions as well. So please have a think about what you'd like to ask our panelists. But um, before I do, I've just got one more question each of them. I'm going to ask you both to do something a little bit dangerous, I suppose, which is to predict the future um, in your field. <laughs> it's never, a, you know, I'm not going to hold you to it, perhaps, but um, in, in uh, let's say, the next decade, what do you think, Ilya, in your field, in your field of engineering, what would you think is going to be the, some of the key, well, one or two of the key developments? What do you see happening? Um, I think transportation, um, it's getting a lot of attention. I think moving goods uh, by ship will remain because it's a very cost-efficient way of doing it. Um, I don't know if the ships will grow any bigger. We are looking at a four set of locks in Panama. We're starting a project to see the trends in the world. Uh, but definitely transportation 
uh, will evolve. Uh, we're, I know they're using like drones now for right. uh, distributing, for example, if you take out food and things like that. So I think that's gonna increase. Um, so transportation, I think we need to look at also. I don't know if you have heard about the Hyperloop uh, one, which they wanna transport people in a fraction of, uh, of time. That looks very interesting. Looks very I just interesting. saw that uh, yeah, this week interesting. in Chicago. It's a classic futuristic Elon Musk idea, of course, but uh, is it something that's ever gonna happen, something like that? It looks... I think, I think it's gonna happen. From what I saw <laughs> last week in Chicago, I, I think it's gonna happen. It, well, it, it first, they're testing right? it in Nevada right now. Uh, so, I mean, I was blown away when I saw this. It's pretty amazing. So, I mean, when you think that cell phones did not exist not too long ago, and look where we're at now, I mean, um, I'm sure everybody, a lot of guys and people in the audience, like my kids don't have a television anymore. They don't care about television. They have a laptop and a phone. That's all you need. So communications is changing significantly. Transportation, I, I see a big move ahead. Um, I think water conservation is, is gonna be key for the future. And I can see that uh, in Panama, we had a big drought this year. Uh, we have to give drought restrictions to the vessels. So we're looking on, on ways of saving water uh, we actually implemented a new technology of uh, water saving basins into the locks to try to save some of that water. I mean, all water eventually will go to the ocean from the rivers, but if we can better utilize it. So I, I would look into that. I, I think uh, transportation, communications, and, and water uh, are definitely things to look at. And of course, besides what you're talking about health and, and what you mentioned about food, I mean, those are, those are definitely in the forefront too. Bob, I, I mean, I asked this question to you as well. I mean, it's difficult because if I had asked in 2006 what were going to be the key developments in the next 10 years, we would never have, you, I mean, it would, be, it would be almost impossible to predict the rise of the, the things we see today. But let me ask you anyway, what, uh, what, what will be the big things in your fields, your multiple fields in the next 10 years? Yeah. Well, see, in the health field, what happens is, you know, I, I break it down to two parts. What discoveries are going to be made and what inventions are going to be made in the text, next 10 years? But keeping in mind, and this gets to the second part, is in the medical field and health field, it takes a long time, maybe more than 10 years, to go from those discoveries and inventions to something that's going to be clinically used because you have to do so much safety testing and proof first in animals and then in people. So with that in mind, well, I guess what I'd say is what, what do I expect that's going to be in people in the next 10 years? You know, that's an easier question in a sense because some of that's already starting to happen with cells and animals. You know, so what you can see, so, some of the things, and I think they'll be fascinating, are ways that you can use nanotechnology to deliver things that can change our genes. Uh, and that could be things like gene editing approaches or, you know, what's called messenger RNA. You know, to, to fundamentally, like if somebody has an enzyme deficiency disease or something like that, that you could change that. You could cure that person. I think, uh, I think another thing that will happen more and more are, are ways to do uh, tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. You know, already you can make new skin for burn victims, but I expect in the next 10 years, we'll start to see people who are paralyzed be treated with new ways of, of, of spinal cord repair. We may see ways of, ch of, of making people who are deaf here, uh, people who uh, vocal cord problems, you know, that those might go away, and, and many others as well. Uh, so I think that those are some of the things that we'll see. And, and then there'll be more discoveries and inventions that, um, you know, we'll, that, that we really can't predict. You know, a lot of times people ask me, what's the most important thing to invest money in now? And I always say, well, it's not something that you, you can give a label to because it doesn't exist yet. You want to give people the freedom to do engineering and science and discover things and invent things that we don't, we can't even today fathom for exactly the reasons you just said, and that will truly change the world. Well, you know, we, we, we all in, in in the media and in politics and everything, everyone talks about something like climate change, um, and you know, last year, people, uh, international governments agreed to quite, you know, incredible targets to try and reduce carbon emissions so that you would, you know, not have huge temperature rises by the end of the century for many, many reasons. I wonder, as two eminent engineers sitting here, when you see things, challenges of that scale, I mean, what they're talking about is global temperature rises no more than 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. We're almost at 1.5 already. Can you meet those challenges? I mean, they're, they're basically shoving it over to you going, right, solve this. We've, we've well, signed the document. Well, 
it's like you, you said, you know, it's it's not going to be overnight, but you need to test different things. You you need to go uh, all these engines. I mean, how many vehicles do we have in the world? So you need to invest in creating new engines that will have less emissions or uh, change the fuel. You know, electric cars we're using now. Can we use solar? If you improve on the technology of solar that you can actually store that energy, because right now the problem is you can't really store it for that long. So, but it takes research. It takes research uh, and you, you need to provide funds for that research. A lot of the private companies do dedicate some uh, money for research and development, but I think governments, as they do uh, in their budget, they also need to provide uh, for research and development so the country can, as, as a whole, uh, invest in, in research and, and development also. Just like in medicine, you need to do that for engineering. But tell me, would you be, engineers are always very realistic, I know this, um, as a former physicist, so engineers are the ones who keep you grounded on these things. Um, are you optimistic? on something like climate change or something like, uh, let's say, mental health diseases, which are at the moment completely inscrutable in many ways. Are you optimistic that these things are problems we can solve? Of course. Yeah, I have no doubt. If uh, you have the resources and the people dedicated to it, it can be solved. I, I, I would share that, exactly. But you said some very important things. You need the people and you definitely need the resources. I mean, I think the biggest danger to me is sort of lack of funding to, to do really good basic yep. science and engineering research. But if that funding is there and if you can attract, you know, really brilliant, you know, young people to do this work, I mean, um, totally agree with what you said. Well, on that optimistic note, let's go to the audience. There are two microphones, so please wait till the microphone comes to you before you say, uh, before you ask. Um, so there's one there, if I can get a microphone to chat in the back. And just tell us who you are and then ask your question. If you have a you want to direct it to anyone in particular? Sure. Hello, uh, my name is Simon Tagala. I'm an artist. Um, a couple of months ago, I went to the Farnborough Air Show to see a particular plane, the Lockheed Martin F-35. And the F-35 has cost a trillion dollars to develop. And it's, it's an unbelievably extraordinary, uh, stunning example of human in ingenuity, but at the same time, utterly terrifying. So my question to the panel is, if you had a trillion dollars at your disposal, uh, what would you do with it? And um, that's sort of an extension of that is, does conflict drive engineering change? And do we engineer out of fear or engineer out of hope? Incredibly large, expansive questions. Um, <laughs> who wants, uh, Ilya, what would you do with a trillion dollars if you had that wow, much money? Wow, that's a lot of money. <laughs> Like I mentioned, I would do some research on uh, energy, different options of energy to improve, because I, I think that's something that the world, I mean, you need energy for everything. The world moves on energy. So if we can create clean energy, affordable energy, I would invest a lot of money on that. And I would also invest a lot of money in water. How do we keep water? clean water, how do we uh, not be wasteful of, of the water that we have on this planet, of the fresh water. Um, a lot of times we get asked like, well, why don't you go to desalinate uh, water? It's very expensive, I know it's gotten better, but then maybe improve on that. How do we desalinate water for drinking, for potable water? So I, I think I would go with energy and, and water. Those would be my two main goals from my perspective. But of course, the world needs has a lot of needs, so maybe well, something for diseases also. <laughs> sure, well, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think we all gravitate towards the things we do because that's partly why we do them. I mean, to me, I would put it on health, and I'll be a little more specific in a second, but the reason for that, I think anybody that, that sees people they know and love suffer, you don't want that to happen, which, and you just want people to have the best lives possible. Uh, and there's still so many people, both in our worlds and the third world, that, that do suffer. So I think that if you had that kind of funding, and I think what the Gates Foundation does is, is a good example of having something like 40 or more billion dollars to try to use it on health that can make a, a research that can make a huge difference. 
Uh, so, you know, a trillion, that sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but there, unfortunately these things cost enormous amounts, and there's still so much we don't know about the brain, about our immune system, you know, and, and, and so many other areas where I think we could make a difference. So I would probably spend it first and foremost on that. Um, and I think it's a little bit of both those things you said, both hope and fear. You know, I think fear that, that people will get ill and hope that we can understand things better and make the world a better place for so many people. Hi, I'm Philippa Jeffress. I'm a civil engineer. And I, it was quite worrying to see that you both kind of accidentally became an engineer rather than a deliberate choice. And I, too, can uh, kind of appreciate that. I was good at maths and sort of physics, and everyone said, oh, maybe you should be an engineer. And I sort of rebelled against it until I accidentally became an engineer. What worries me is there's a lot of problems that engineers are supposed to be solving, and leaving things to chance and accident doesn't seem the best way about going through that. So what would you say to your sort of your previous selves when you were starting down your career route now to encourage yourself into engineering where it was an actual active choice to go into the profession rather than, oh, well, I might as well? That's a great question. Add to that, would you change your way? Because I think that there is something to be said about meandering. I, I would not change what I do now for nothing. I mean, I love it. It's, it's great. Uh, no, but rather, I mean, the path you took to get getting there. No, I, I wouldn't change the path either. Because, and, and I'm going to tell you, I have three kids, and none of them are studying engineering. None of them. I mean, I have a psychology uh, major, I have a philosophy major, and I have a chef. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I would not, and actually, my father is a medical doctor, and my mother, when I graduated from high school, wanted me to study medicine. And I said, uh, it's not what I like. She says, I'll buy you a BMW if you stay in Panama and study medicine. I says, mom, you can buy me too. I'm, I'm not, I'm not. I, I think it needs to be explored uh, on its own. And I mean, I was really good in math in school. So it wasn't like I didn't like it, but it was not my dream. I just wanted to scuba dive and do fishes and stuff like that. But I, you know, life, uh, changed my ways and I my husband wanted to force my kids to go into engineering one of the three and I said well let you know let them be I didn't want to be a doctor so I and I'm happy so I, I think it's important but I think one of the key things is that I think education in general needs to change education needs to become more fun more uh, learning by maybe doing and, and seeing than memorizing and reading. And I think that's something that governments need to realize, that the world has changed and education needs to improve. And I think science and technology can be a lot of fun if you teach it the right way. And then maybe it will be more natural for somebody that's coming up like, I really wanna be an engineer. Because when you go into engineering, I mean, when you're in high school, you learn calculus, you, you, you know, it's not fun. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, unless you like numbers. I mean, I love it because I will, I will solve the problem, but for most people, math is not fun in high school. So if you teach uh, engineering in a way that is fun in high school, that you can see what you're creating, what you're doing, what you're making, and in any, I mean, whether if it's mechanical, civil, structural, geotechnical, I mean, I think then maybe you will have more people being happy with engineering and not just with entertainment. So I think education has a lot to do with it. Well, would you, first of all, would you change your path? Or, and, and how would you go about encouraging others to sort of think more directly about engineering rather yeah. than falling into it? Yeah, well, I guess we, we see eye to eye on a lot of things. I, I completely agree with what you said. I, I wouldn't change a thing. I, I feel even mistakes I've made, and going into engineering was not one of those mistakes, but, but, but I, I, I feel like I've grown from whatever I've done, and I love what I do. I wouldn't, wouldn't change anything. Um, I think that, what, I think it's a great question that you asked, but my feeling actually goes back to what I said before, is that I think a lot of it's communication to the world so that young people can have a better understanding of what engineering is. I mean, there's nothing better from what you know, than what people here are doing with the Queen Elizabeth Prize and the Royal Academy of Engineering. I mean, you're publicizing, you're letting the world know about engineering, and uh, and not actually just not just people in London. I mean, I think that what you're doing here, what the U.S. tries to do with the National Academy of Engineering and its grand challenges, I think these things are great. More of that would be even better. And if the news media, you know, gets more involved and, and people write books and 
make heroes out of engineers, all kinds, you know, from all different kinds of disciplines. You know, I think that it's, it's getting those messages across where young people will, will read about them and see them so that it won't be an accident anymore, you know, because a society does get what it celebrates. So you want to celebrate that kind of thing. And I, I, I think that can be done, but it's, it, it requires, you know, I just think better communication. Um, and I think that's, you're right on. We celebrate a lot of sports right. and a lot of uh, things that don't resolve problems in life. And we don't exalt as much the engineering work. And people take things for granted. For example, video games. Everybody loves video games. It takes a lot of engineers to get a good video game going. So if you exalt not just the video game, but who did it, what kind of a person did that, then maybe if, if like you say, the media would exalt both, not just the video game, but how do we get there? I think engineering will become a lot more fun at the early stage for kids. Is, is if I can just be a lot of questions, is one way of doing the, the things you're suggesting um, to reframe problems as, you know, as challenges, like, like you say, there is a huge challenge in how we power the world over the next 50 years and without destroying our planet. There is a huge challenge in dealing with Alzheimer's disease. And it happens to be that if you want to solve those problems, you have to do, take this particular path to do them, rather than saying, go and study engineering, then find, a, then find something to do. So rather than saying, off you go, Here, here's a bunch of calculus you need to do and a bunch of other things, and then there's some random things you could do at the end of it. Rather than that, but thinking where this, where this will take you. Is, is, that, is that a way of getting a narrative out of this, a story that people like to sort of go, I want to solve this problem in yeah, 15 example, years? When, when people go out in space, the, the, the man that walked the moon, Who's the famous one? The astronaut. Nothing is said about the people that designed the vessel that got the man to the moon. So, so I think the focus needs to be on both. You know, who made it possible? Yeah, the astronaut, of course, he needs to be celebrated, but let's celebrate also the people that th th they did the computer program, that, that designed the vessel, because it gets lost in translation and it gets taken for granted. So I think that's a way also to realize, like, oh my God, I can make a difference in the world. And I think naturally it's innate in people to want to make a difference in the world or I hope so uh, so I, I think if you can prove that to people they will be a lot more interested and then you will spark a lot of more creativity and innovation in people too uh, my name is Max Grogan I'm a biochemistry student um, so with the dawn of technology such as CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing in recent years uh, large-scale gene editing is becoming more and more of an inevitable reality uh, which leads us on to sort of ethical debates such as designer children and cosmetic alterations to sort of the general population. Do you think that's sort of a path we should approach with caution or maybe not at all, or is it an inevitability? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I wonder, Bob, if you would take that one, but also just explain what CRISPR-Cas9 is for those other engineers and others in the audience who may not know. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You're the best person to explain yeah. it. Sure. Say. Well, CRISPR-Cas9 is a, a way to sort of edit genes. So if you were able to edit genes that could impart, could either correct characteristics that are flawed or maybe add ones that might do something, which is, I think, what you're saying. Well, I, I think that, I mean, I'm all for things that can cure disease and treat disease, but I suppose, you know, you could start to think of making super people and stuff like that, and I, I guess I, I wouldn't be for that. And I, I think that ultimately... I do feel you will probably need, you know, some type of legislation or way of oversight, you know, to to look at these kinds of things, because. Uh, but I, I so I think it really depends on, on on what's being done. I don't think that we want to, um, you know, m make people from scratch or things like that. And um, and, I, and so I I think you, there probably will need to be laws or oversight in place as as areas like that. Um, you know, evolve and develop. I mean, it's worth saying CRISPR is one of the most exciting biomedical, biotechnological advances, and it wouldn't have been predicted 10 years ago either, would it, really? Right. It's no, another that's thing. That's correct. <laughs> that's the, um, the, the pace of technology changing and of things advancing, it's, it's, the gap is shortening. Every time, it's, it's faster. Uh, and you can do quite some quite incredible things with it, um, as you say. But... Um, Ilya, again, the, the, what the question was raising there was again was ethics of technology and engineering. It's one thing to launch forward into all sorts of ideas, but you don't necessarily want to do everything, do you? 
No, that's that's and that's what what Bob mentioned. You do need regulations. You do need governments, definitely to to regulate. To what extent are we going to use all these technological uh, advances that we're that kind of discovering? Predictions about how you're using things, and that's that's, that's really why you hard. Need to have that communication between scientists and governments. Some more questions, please. Right, oh, loads now. Uh, one here. Uh, why don't we go for you two, and then over here, why don't you get the microphone, and then we'll pass it down. Yeah, please. I'm Yasmin Ali. I'm a chemical engineer. And my question is, wh when do we stop engineering, or how do we know when we've reached whatever it is that we're aiming for? So it's kind of related to the previous question. And with if I think about medical engineering, are we creating some kind of perfect human being that lives forever? Or where are we going with all of this and when do we know to stop? Before you answer that, let me take one more, just take, where was it, here? Yeah. Which one you answer, because we're coming to the Hi, end. Hi, my so. name is Shvetal and I'm a software analyst. Uh, my question is, obviously you're working on um, engineering projects in your field, but if there was an engineering project that you could be part of, which is either outside of your field or in your field, what would it be? and also what inspires you. Okay, take one final question and th that, that'll be all unfortunately. Just here, just give us your question and Bob and Ilya, you can choose between you, which ones you answer. My name is Lin Feng Wang, a biochemistry student. Uh, so when you talk about the future of uh, medicine, you always talk about curing diseases and that's obviously very important, but uh, I wanna ask um, what's going to happen in the future about um, What's gonna change about the lifestyle and living about more healthy people in general? Let's mm. say in, uh, in ten years, in terms of medicine. Those those three questions. So, um, when do we stop engineering, and where's this all going? I suppose. Um, are there engineering projects you would like to do outside your own field, and what's kind of inspired you to do those things? And what's what's a healthy lifestyle like? Is that what your your question was at the end there? What does a healthy lifestyle look like? So. Bob, maybe you go, take, take your pick of those questions. Well, let me try to see if I can wrap them up and together. Um, <laughs> so the first and the third, one of my friends always says that perfect is the enemy of good. And, and I think there's some truth to that. I, I mean, I think that you, you know, I, I think that what you want to do is relieve suffering. I mean, to me, that is the important thing. If we can relieve suffering, you know, whether it's because of starving or diseases of, of young people and things like that, I, I think that those are very important. I think that, um, and, and I would prioritize those most highly. I think in the next 10 years, you know, medicine, as much as I'd like, discoveries move quickly. Medicine does not move that quickly because uh, it, it takes so long, as I mentioned, to, to get new things approved. I mean, I don't expect a lot of say, gene-edited drugs in the next 10 years that will be widely used on people. I do think some of the things I mentioned earlier, you'll start to see, you know, move into the clinic. But medicine takes a long time. So I don't think you'll see that much change in the next 10 years, just like I think if you look at the last 10 years, the discoveries have been unbelievable. But that doesn't mean we've, you know, seen, you know, medicine change ultra rapidly. I mean, certainly there'll be changes made. and. Tied to medicine, what I'd say is if I looked at the other things I might want to do, you know, hundreds of years from now, I do feel we'll have a lot of diseases treated, going back to your question, and a lot of cures. But I don't know that we'll have natural disasters cured. Hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, those kinds of things, you know, I think will cause and could cause even worse problems and, and, and environmental issues and so forth. So that's an area that I've often thought about would be an important one to you know, try to really make some headway in, and I think very little uh, has really been done. Um, I think engineering will be forever. As long as there's things to solve, engineer will be there when you're gonna need to solve a problem. So I, I don't see an end to it. And, and I think medicine, uh, they're making an emphasis on preventing more than curing in a sense too. So you have all that research on curing, but you also have a lot of research in preventing. So I, I think engineering will continue forever. As long as okay. we exist in this planet, uh, there will always be things to say. I'm very well said about also, you know, we cannot predict earthquakes, uh, tsunamis. So as long as 
those things will happen in this planet, you need engineering to make the perfect building that will not collapse, or uh, how do we predict in better ways a tsunami so people could move away and, and save their lives? So I, I think engineering will be here forever. I mean, there always would be something to solve. Um, I think geotechnical engineering, it's, it's a fascinating field that I, if I had to do something differently, I would look into that. Um, I've learned a lot of it now with this project. I never dream of caring about it. But now with this, all this excavation and earth moving and foundations for the new locks, uh, I, I think that's really quite an interesting field. So that, that's something I would look to look, like to look at. Okay, well, thank you both very much. That's all we have time for in terms of questions. Finally, though, please join me in thanking the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering for organizing this session and also to our two panelists, Bob and to Elia.